Wendy Brown is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Political Science. Also affiliated with the designated emphasis in critical theory, she teaches political theory. A California native, she has been educated and taught by both public and private institutions of higher learning. Her speech tonight is entitled, Why Privatization is, more than who, is About More Than Who Pays. Wendy. I know how to give a speech like Rob Reich, but I'm not going to. <laughs> In fact, I know how to do all of these, but I'm not going to. I'm actually not going to. I'm actually going to take us over to the dark side for a little while, because there's much talk about privatizing UC, and I want to talk a little bit about what's at stake in that possible future, the future we're very, very seriously threatened with. The future, indeed, that is partly already upon us, uh, but would, if allowed to unfold, unmitigated, unstopped, unprotested, uh, would be a very, very serious alteration in what we are, what we do, what this institution is. Privatiz privatization means many things. It obviously involves replacing fun public funding with student fees, growing corporate sponsorship of academic research, increased reliance on endowments, involvement with the stock and bond markets. But at its most basic, it signals a transformation from an institution that is publicly supported and serves a public purpose to one that is organized to sell products to consumers, whether those are students purchasing an education as Rob Reich just spoke about, or investors purchasing research results. It entails converting an institution that is based on principles of a common good, equality, inclusion, self-governance, and the ineffability of certain kinds of human development and knowledge, converting such an institution to one that is increasingly bound to entrepreneurship, capital appreciation, and is governed by organizational principles of hierarchy, inequality, immediate commodifiability, and applicability of its endeavors. And what I want to do now is just point to a few of the mechanisms and identify a few of the crucial effects of this kind of shift. As you have heard, privatizing public entities and market societies is not new, but we're at a watershed point in its acceleration and in its widespread embrace. For decades, Californians enthusiastically supported public education and other public goods. This changed fundamentally during the Reagan governorship years, 1967 to 75, the years germinating the so-called taxpayer revolts that would eventually catapult Reagan to the presidency. Now importantly, what was then called Reaganomics, what we now call neoliberalism, of which privatization is a dimension, consists not just in economic deregulation, tax cuts, and so forth. It consists fundamentally in disseminating market values to every sphere of human activity. With, within neoliberalism, market principles literally depart the market sphere to organize and govern every domain of human existence. And that means that neoliberalism in particular, privatization especially, involves a forthright assault on the very idea of public goods and values. As Margaret Thatcher, one of the world's most ardent neoliberals and open-handed neoliberals famously once remarked, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women. That is, could be the motto of what we're talking about here. Now you can see this process in a nutshell in Prop 13, the 1978 legislation that you've heard about from every single one of us, the legislation that capped the Reagan gubernatorial years. I wanna add something to Kevin's history because conventionally, Prop 13 is described as a populist tax revolt. What's important to remember about Prop 13 is that it was actually a response to court-mandated equality in school funding. That is, it was a retort to the California Supreme Court decisions that required redistributing property tax revenue in order to fund schools in rich and poor neighborhoods at the same level. That would have been a great idea, but what Prop 13 did was make sure there was no revenue to distribute. 
So Prop 13 was quite literally a rebellion against equality in the name of all those old people who were being pushed out of their houses because of inflated housing prices, but in fact that was not the reality. It was a rebellion against equality. It was a rebellion against the very value of quality public education for all, and it was a rebellion against democracy. The minority rule that it wrote into law was a dramatic subversion of popular sovereignty and a subversion with the market principle that you get to keep what you've earned and no democracy can tell you otherwise. Now Prop 13 in this regard is a crude microcosm of what was to come. The steady erosion of the very idea of public goods, the erosion of the, of the value of progressive taxation to support them, the erosion of equality as a value in education, and the erosion of democratic principles of governance and shared power, all of which are now fighting for what remains of their lives. Now at this juncture, we cannot say a simple yes or no to privatization. The beast is already inside the house. What we can do is make the strongest possible case for renewed public support to strive to keep the beast small, contained, maybe even tamed. And to this end, what I want to do in what remains of the time is list 10 things that privatization generates as it brings market principles into the very heart of the university. Each of these is already present in the university in some form, but each of these dire consequences would be extended by the intense and rapid privatization with which we are now threatened. So privatization entails first, something we've all talked about, decreased commitment to educating California's best students, a shift from meritocracy to plutocracy, a turn away from equal opportunity. As the rush toward out-of-state admissions for revenue purposes makes clear, student access will be, with privatization, increasingly driven by purchase power rather than by who belongs here or whom a public institution is meant to serve, let alone by the commitment to generating social equality through education that several of the previous speakers have talked about. So that's what privatization means first. Second, it means increasing inequality in every strand and strata of the university and a diminished sense of shared purpose within the university. Concretely, this takes the form of huge and unprecedented salary differentials across faculty within and between departments. It means huge and unprecedented differentials in departmental resources, in graduate student funding packages, and in the costs of undergraduate majors and degrees. It also means the departure from the principle that the diverse teaching and research needs and the diverse revenue generating capacities of the university as a whole that necessarily carry, carry each other, that, that that principle will be departed from. Some, some research and teaching requires expensive labs or field work, others require only a great library. Some research has ready external grant support, others doesn't. Some subjects can be taught only in small venues like languages, others can be taught in grand lecture halls. It's only when the whole university has a shared purpose that these differences can be balanced and accommodated. And it's that shared purpose that is absolutely undone by the dissemination, dissemination of entrepreneurial principles across the university. Third privatization means decreased support for all elements of the university that are not, as Yudof put it, entrepreneurial. It means decreased support for all aspects of curriculum and research that are not readily applicable or commodifiable. And that obviously especially affects the humanities and arts, the soft social sciences, but it's not only them. Because privatization also means, fourth, deteriorating support for basic research as opposed to applied research. That is, it means not just favoring business over arts and engineering over Shakespeare, it means declining support for exploratory, speculative research in all fields. And that's the kind of research widely understood by scholars as the knowledge fundament from which all applications develop. In other words, privatization means out with Einstein, out with Darwin, out with Aristotle, in with Bill Gates, in with genetic food modifiers, and in with campaign strategists. Privatization means fifth, research increasingly contoured by and to corporate and state
funders. That is, research that's not only curved toward its sponsors, but which often risks overt compromise or corruption by the very need to serve or attract sponsors. This is already a very familiar story in the sciences, and the corrupting effects of big pharma in medical schools is a growing scandal, not only at Harvard, although it's a very big scandal at Harvard, just as Department of Defense recognition that anthropology can be useful to counterinsurgency campaigns is bringing a shower of money, but also controversy, to corners of that discipline. Sixth, and related, privatization means constricted academic freedom on many levels. From containing the free range of imagination and innovation that results from pressure toward application and obtaining corporate sponsorship, to literally silencing faculty who are seen as standing in the way of landing big private donors. And nothing captured this last more chillingly than a tiny incident several years ago during the British Petroleum Energy and Biosciences Institute controversy when our chancellor, formally quite zealous about academic freedom, privately warned a brave young member of the science faculty that persisting in his objections to the BP deal would discredit him and harm his future. Seventh, privatization means increased exploitation of workers. Privatized institutions, and especially privatizing institutions, are historically more hostile to unions, more effective in breaking them, subject to fewer labor regulations and contracts, and more inclined to make use of part-time work that keeps worker associations and bargaining positions weak. More generally, eight, privatization means shrinking from all public values and public concerns. Consider, when the University of Oregon affiliated with a watchdog agency, merely monitoring work conditions of American companies in the third world, just checking out the sweatshops and the child labor phenomenons, the president of Nike quietly withdrew his $30 million gift to the University of Oregon. And that story has many variations and repetitions over recent years. More generally, as more and more scientific and especially medical research is funded by corporations, incentives openly diminish for research that would serve public purposes. Harvard Medical School, to pick an example, now has three professorships endowed by leading sleep medications, and none, of course, oriented toward the ravaging effects of malaria and AIDS in the third world. And that story, too, is repeated over and over. Nine, privatization means replacing shared governance with business management principles. It means increased influence and involvement by non-academics in academic matters. This takes the concrete form of participation by funders and departments and in institutes. And again, we saw that with the British Petroleum and also Novartis events. But it also takes the form of managerially minded university presidents eschewing the power of faculty to set standards and compass points for their university. Finally, 10th, privatization means education increasingly organized to produce what President Yudof has called efficient instructional delivery systems, that's us, <laughs> and, to generate, and to generate human capital, that's you. That's, those were his terms for what UC does and what it offers to the state. And again, I don't think he's the problem, but he is a symptom in this language of what privatization entails. Now, efficient instructional delivery systems generating human capital do not represent education on the model that has just been spoken about, developing, deepening, broadening the mind with perspective, with discernment, with historical consciousness, with diverse knowledges and literacies. Efficient instructional delivery systems generating human capital are not producing thinkers who can apprehend the very processes I am describing, who can trace its history, who can theorize its power, who can calculate its destructiveness, who can limit its losses in art or in poetry. Rather, instructional delivery systems generating human capital are literally producing cogs for the machine, or to update the metaphor, generating new bits of LinkedIn human capital.
In sum, now I'm gonna sum up those 10 points in a word. That's the moment where the sleepy student just pops up and gets the pencil out. Privatization of a public university means narrowed access, expanded inequalities, destroyed shared purposes, devalued knowledge and research that is not entrepreneurial or applicable, research that is contoured toward corporate and away from public ends, constricted academic freedom, eroded shared governance, an education that is rich, deep, broad, and critical, radically eschewed. This is the future of the University of California unless we can persuade the UC president, the regents, the governor, the legislature, and above all, California voters to prevent it. It will be a huge battle, and it is worth everything we have to give it.